So welcome everybody. Uh, you know, today we are very fortunate to have uh, with us uh, Professor Tom Dietrich uh, from Oregon State University. Uh, you know, uh, on behalf of you know all of Penn State, uh, Dr. Dietrich, welcome. You know, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, Dr. Dietrich is a distinguished professor emeritus in the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Oregon State University. Uh, Dr. Dietrich is one of the pioneers of the field of machine learning and has authored more than 200 refereed publications and two books. His current research topics include robust artificial intelligence, robust human AI systems, and applications in sustainability. Uh, Dr. Dietrich has devoted many years of service to the research community. He's a former president of the Association for the Advancement of AI, one of the, you know, one of the most important conferences that we have, and the founding president of the International Machine, Machine Learning Society. Other major roles include executive direct editor of the Journal of Machine Learning, co-founder of the Journal for Machine Learning Research, and program chair of AAAI 1990 and NIPS 2000. He currently serves as one of the moderators for the CS.LG category and archive. Uh, once again, uh, Dr. Dietrich, welcome, and you know we are we are very uh, so, you know we, we, we're very excited to to hear what you have to say. Uh, whenever you're ready, uh, please feel free to share your slides and begin. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, let me hide the floating meeting controls so I can see my own slides. All right. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak. Uh, uh, as I was saying, I've, I've always wanted to visit uh, Penn State, and um, this is at least a, a step in that direction, uh, and certainly we'll have a great day uh, talking with various people. So uh, I, the title of my talk is Steps Toward Trustworthy Machine Learning, and uh, this joint work, of course, with many people here, um, but several of my former students, Jesse Hostetler, uh, Majid Alka Italgan, uh, Siliu Rishik Garapali and uh, a student with a colleague of mine, Kim Meyer Hall, and two faculty members, Alan Fern, who uh, is now leading our AI group, and uh, Joe Albers, who is a uh, uh, natural resources economist at the University of Wyoming and was his advisor. Uh, oops, keyboard focus. So um, the, the talk will be in three parts. I'm going to start, and like a good computer scientist, I'm indexing from zero. Um, the first part is about uh, sort of zooming out to the big picture of how I think about robust artificial intelligence um, by comparison with robust human organizations. And I, I, I think uh, we have lessons we can learn from uh, what, what people understand about how human organizations can, can be robust in the face of risk and uncertainty. And then uh, the second part, or part one, will be about competence modeling. So one of the things we'll see is that um, uh, it's very important for an AI system to be able to give a, a prospective guarantee on its behavior. Um, and those will be what we call calibrated prediction intervals. And then uh, the, the part two will be about anomaly detection. Uh, and I'll, I'll just touch on a couple of topics. We've been working in this area for uh, the last 15 years, roughly. Um, uh, but I'll talk about uh, two of the things that, that, that we're most excited about, which is incorporating feedback in the anomaly detection process and uh, open category detection with guarantees. Okay, so um, many of you may uh, re remember the, the uh, uh, the, the Three Mile Island uh, nuclear power plant uh, problem that, that occurred many years ago now. And growing out of that, there was a, uh, uh, some popular press books and, and also uh, several uh, sort of uh, engineering folks who said, well, things like nuclear power plants are too complicated for us to, the systems are too complex for us to manage safely. And uh, somewhat as a backlash to that, people in the management and, um, and, and uh, organizational sciences uh, said, no, no, um, there are human organizations that can maintain very high reliability. And, they, and this was particularly came out of uh, three uh, researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, Laporte, Rockland, and Roberts. And what they did was study uh, things like air traffic control, uh, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, aircraft carrier operations to try to understand how these organizations uh, manage to, to keep their error rates very low. And they articulate five properties of the, or practices of, of these organizations. The first is uh, what they call preoccupation with failure. 
but the key thing is that the people in these organizations have the fundamental belief that the system that they're managing, uh, the aircraft carrier or the power plant, have unobserved failure modes, unknown, not unknown failure modes. And so that's a very important prior position uh, to take cognitively. Um, well, so how can you learn about unobserved failure modes before the failures occur? Well, one thing is to watch for anomalies and near misses and view those as symptoms of a potential uh, problem with the system. Um, and so then the second uh, practice is uh, when you do get an anomaly or a near miss to comprehensively understand the situation. Don't stop with the first um, uh, hypothesis that comes to mind, but uh, take a very scientific approach of generating multiple hypotheses and then testing them. Um, the third thing, which they give the strange name of sensitivity to operations, really means that there are some people in the organization whose only job is to maintain situational awareness. Uh, what's the state of the system? What's going on? And the fourth is really training. You train for resilience. So you practice uh, improvisational problem solving to try to work around uh, surprises in, in, in management. And the last principle, which actually has gotten the most attention, I think, in the popular press, is what they say call deference to expertise. But it's the idea that in a crisis, the person that's going to make the decision, it should be the person who has the most knowledge about that, the problem, not managers uh, and so on. And this has become uh, very influential, particularly in the patient safety movement in medicine, right, uh, in which the idea is that for instance, in the operating room, uh, any member of the, of the operating team can call a halt to a surgery if they see a problem that needs to be addressed. And, and the, goal, the goal is really to empower the nurses and the, and the anesthesiologist and so on over the surgeon who, you know, traditionally is sort of like the, the general of the war uh, and, and uh, traditionally has been very hard to question that person. And in uh, air, air, uh, aircraft pilot training, um, there's another thing that is sort of known euphemistically as cockpit resource management, but it's the same thing that often the you know the pilot in command has always been the you know the the absolute commander of the of the plane, but when their attention gets drawn into some problem, they can lose situational awareness and start making bad mistakes, and so they try to train co-pilots and other crew members to help break into that tunnel vision, pull the pilot out of it. Um, uh, and so it's a lot about teamwork and how to, to manage those very difficult situations. Okay, so why do I mention this in the context of artificial intelligence? Well, I think uh, we can uh, view these as sort of five specifications for the behavior of an AI system also. And we can think about it at first from the point of view of uh, an AI system that is autonomous by itself, but how can it achieve high reliability? Um, and so I think of it as just these four properties. We need to maintain situational awareness. And here we have lots of great techniques already, right? Um, we have uh, uh, the ability to integrate data from multiple sensors, really superhuman ability to integrate information. Um, and then uh, these systems need to be able to detect anomalies and near misses. And we, uh, as I'll talk about in this talk a bit, we have uh, a set of techniques for anomaly detection, although um, we still have big challenges, especially in deep learning. Uh, but this notion of near misses, um, I, I haven't seen addressed very much in the, in the AI literature. Of course, um, uh, the old timers among us will think about Pat Winston's uh, PhD thesis but that was a different kind of near miss. But here we're thinking about uh, near miss in a high risk setting. And then of course, generating candidate explanations for anomalies and near misses. Um, the trick here is that these explanations are going to be sort of outside the problem space of the current system. Because if they were inside the problem space, they would, they would uh, the system would already be able to handle them. And similarly, improvisational problem solving uh, how can we have a system that can extend or operate outside of its uh, initial or, or operating system model? Um, so it seems that this requires some sort of, um, I'd say metacognition to reason about uh, the, the current formulation of the problem and ask, should, does the problem need to be reformulated in some way? 
Uh, so these are big things. And so um, if I were to uh, give a report card on these for the AI uh, community right now, I would say we get an A for situational awareness, uh, maybe a B for anomaly detection, and we've got failing grades for the other two. <clears throat> But uh, perhaps the more important version of, of um, robust AI is for an AI system to, to, to be uh, augmenting a human team. Um, and how can we ensure that, the, that when we add technology to a human team, that we don't damage it, damage its teamwork, uh, damage its reliability? Um, and so I would argue that even very powerful AI systems will be surrounded by a human organization. Um, and so what can the AI contribute to that? Well, obviously situational awareness is, I think the number one thing, uh, but, uh, but now how do we establish a shared mental model between the AI system and the humans? Um, and, uh, and I think this is an area you know, that is uh, virtually untouched. Uh, and then uh, on the other hand, we have humans must be aware of things like what version of the AI system are using, when was it last updated and trained, this is kind of the human uh, situational awareness about the AI. Um, and then of course we have uh, anomalies and near misses, not only in the external world, but within the team and is the team performing properly? Would the AI system ever be in a position where it should say, I think the team, the human team is breaking down and we need to uh, uh, stop our operations and back off. Um, and then again, we, uh, this question of could we assist humans in coming up with explanations for the anomalies and could we support human improvisational problem solving and there are just a few few examples in the literature and and uh, maybe some of you um, know of other things that that I'm not aware of but uh, but one that comes to mind is mixed initiative planning where a human and an AI planning system can collaborate to to come up with a plan so here I think um, you know, we're not doing very well on any of these uh, and there's a huge amount of room for improvement. Okay, so now let's uh, zoom way down and just look at, at the problem of, uh, let's imagine that we have a single uh, a, a human interacting with a, an AI system um, and, uh, and imagine that the human decision maker needs to decide whether to, to command an AI assistant this would be more like an autonomous assistant, but right? command it to go ahead and execute its current policy pi, starting in some the current state S0 and execute for eight steps. And the human wants to ask the, the AI system, if I press go, how will you behave? Uh, given that we're currently in state S0. And what we wanna get back from the AI system is what we call a trajectory wise confidence interval. So um, the idea is this is our time axis and, uh, and this is some sort of um, uh, variable of interest that describes the behavior of the system. Maybe it's a uh, uh, total reward so far or uh, amount of resources consumed or whatever. But, and then this is an upper confidence bound along the trajectory and a lower confidence bound along the trajectory. And we would like that with probability one minus delta, the true trajectory that the, that the agent follows lies inside those bounds. And then the human can look at this and either say, oh, that's a really wide confidence interval um, that, that, in, that covers some bad outcomes. Maybe, maybe I want to do something else or can say, okay, I'm going to press go. And, and, uh, and then the um, AI system goes and does the, does the, uh, executes the policy. Well, how can we get um, this kind of confidence interval that applies to an entire trajectory? And, uh, and basically, uh, I'll first sort of summarize the approach and then we'll go into it in a bit more detail. So the idea is first, we're going to collect up a set of training trajectories. So we sample a starting state from some uh, starting state distribution, and then we execute the policy in that, in that starting state for H steps. So this assumes either that I have a really good model so I can do this in simulation, or that I can collect, for example, historical um, data. Um, and and a, a very important assumption in what I'm talking about today is this, that the starting states are being sampled from some starting state distribution, which might just be the distribution of states the system typically is in. Um, 
And so then we're going to apply our technique and it consists of two steps basically. The first is that we're going to perform what's called quantile regression. And what that's going to do is uh, predict um, a, uh, you know, an upper confidence bound and a lower confidence bound. And these are the delta over two and one minus delta over two quantiles of this uh, performance, uh, uh, say cumulative reward. And the red uh, trajectory here is the actual trajectory for a particular, uh, this is a, a particular uh, test trajectory. And then the second thing we're going to do is uh, add a, uh, unfortunately quantile regression by itself does not actually give a performance guarantee. It's sort of a best effort to estimate the quantiles of a distribution. But then to get a guarantee, we need to adjust those intervals, uh, widen them uh, as little as possible in order to get a one minus delta guarantee. And we're going to do that using a technique known as conformal uh, prediction. Okay, so um, let me just review what quantile regression is. So right, so so normally we think of a, of a regression as um, trying to estimate the, the expected value of, of a response variable y conditioned on some uh, uh, input we want various quantiles of that distribution. So, you know, this is a, a, a nice example from uh, University of Virginia um, uh, where they, the, where this is a classic case of heteroskedasticity, right? Where um, the amount of variation in the response variable, in addition to the mean, the mean is increasing as X increases, but the amount of variation is also increasing as X increases. Um, and so uh, uh, one thing you can do here is to try to predict the cumulative distribution function. If we if we slice through here at x equals 75, where there's some distribution over the values of y, right, ranging from probably five up to 20 or something, and we can uh, imagine the CDF of y conditioned on x, and then the quantiles of that is the inverse CDF, right? So given a target quantile like 0.9 here, um, we're going to get this blue, uh, the top blue line. And the claim is that, that, uh, that at each point along the curve here, 90% um, of the data points are below that line and 10% of the data points would be above that line. And there are several algorithms for quantile regression. Um, they're sort of generalizations of, the, of median regression where the goal is just to find the median. And to do that, you, uh, you minimize the absolute value of the errors in the, in the regression uh, uh, formula. So you use the absolute loss. So there's something called the um, pinball loss, which is the um, which are tilted versions of the uh, of the absolute value function. So I'm going to be applying quantile random forests, which came, were developed by Meinshausen back in 2006, um, that basically build a random forest and then uh, extract uh, quantile statistics from it. <clears throat> okay, so now we can apply quantile regression to trajectories, basically. Um, Again, we're going to collect up a set of, uh, of data points. We'll assume that we're in a discrete time, uh, but possibly continuous state and action uh, MDP, and that we're executing a fixed control policy that tells us what action to perform in each state. And so this, again, is our time axis. This is our cumulative rewards uh, for starting from the start state and summing up the rewards as we go along. Um, and. Uh, um, and so the idea is that along a trajectory, we can collect up the states, the actions, and the rewards into a data structure tau, which we'll call the trajectory. And then we, uh, we can define a behavior function B that takes tau and a time step and uh, summarizes the behavior of the policy uh, at time t. And that could be something about the current state, the immediate reward, what I'm going to use, which is the cumulative reward, could be the future reward uh, until we reach the, the, the horizon at H. Whatever it is, we will uh, uh, lump all that together into something that we will call a behavior vector, uh, capital B or, or bold B. And, uh, and our goal is to get a confidence interval on that behavior vector. So then we'll fit quantile regression functions for each time step and for delta over two and one minus delta over two. And so that's what I've depicted here. Each of these is, is the prediction from an uh, uh, independent quantile regression. 
Um, so I have 50 quantile regressions, and then I'm getting the, the, the two quantiles out of those. And the, again, the red uh, things here, uh, just for reference, uh, are, is the actual trajectory for test trajectory 60. It's important to note that we want this, uh, I mean, the whole point here is that we want this confidence interval to depend on the starting state and not on any subsequent state. So, so the quantile function we're taking as our predictor variables, the variables that describe the starting state. And then we have to predict, say, you know, the cumulative reward at time 25 uh, predict its quantiles. <clears throat> but you could use neural networks. There are many other things for, for doing this quantile regression. Okay, so now how can we get a, a confidence interval, a statistical guarantee on quantile regression? Well, there's a beautiful paper that was published at NeurIPS 2019 by Romano, Patterson, and Candes from Stanford, uh, in which they apply a technique called conformal prediction to conformalize the quantile regression. So conformal prediction is a framework that was developed by Vladimir Voff and uh, um, uh, Gammerman and Schaefer um, in the early 2000s. And they have a book uh, in which they, they uh, put, a, and several published articles. And there's a, the core idea is, is uh, beautifully simple. And so I'll, I'm gonna try to explain it here. Um, but the basic idea is that, you know, when we put this quantile, uh, this, we have our quantile regression curve here, a prediction, we can calculate the uh, sort of residuals or errors with respect to it. So this point is much higher than the curve by that amount. You know, and this point is much lower than the curve by this amount. And as I said, we're hoping that the curve is the 90th quantile of this thing. But um, um, the idea is that uh, we're going to have two sets of data. I should back up. <laughs> we'll need, uh, this is known as splits conformal prediction. So we're using two different uh, uh, data, uh, data sets. The first is used to estimate our, do our quantile regressions. And the second is used to, um, to then do this conformalization step. And so for each of the data points that's in our conformalization data set, we're going to calculate the difference between the observed point and the curve. And we'll call that C sub i. And then we're going to sort those into ascending order. And so now this is their, their um, these are known as the order statistics, right? This is the smallest value, this is the largest value, and that's their sorted order. And then we're going to define our, uh, the um, upper confidence bound, the corrected uh, value here, as the, um, the quantile regression plus a correction term. And the correction term is going to be this element. It's basically the one minus delta element times n plus one. Okay, so we have n data points, but we multiply this by the plus one, which is kind of allowing an n plus first point to come in. Um, and so that's going to give us a new regression line that will be, well, it could be actually higher or lower than the blue one, because it could be that these, you know, that more than 90% of these are negative, and so it will actually pull the curve down a little bit. But in any case, it's going to correct the curve. Now, why is this uh, valid? Well, let's think about that new data point, xn plus one, yn plus one. Of course, we can calculate its uh, departure from the blue line also. And now the key observation is that these CI values that we've computed are exchangeable. That is to say, they are independent conditioned on the regression uh, F inverse, right? So given we know F inverse, the order in which the, uh, these, um, uh, the points in D2 are processed and therefore the order in which we compute the CIs is irrelevant. So if we imagine, suppose we imagine um, that, we, that we have this, our query point, the, the new point that we're going to wanna be making a prediction on, Xn plus one, um, suppose we have its C value and we add it to the ordered list here. Then we could ask, well, uh, that will give us N plus one sorted values. Uh, we don't know where it is, but the key thing is because the C values are exchangeable, the rank of this new point is going to be uniformly distributed among these ranks, right? And so therefore, if we choose the one minus delta um, uh, uh, element in that ranking, rounding up, this is the ceiling operator. It's a little hard to read this notation, but uh, to the next larger data point, then uh, with probability one minus delta, at least one minus delta, the N plus first response value will be less than or equal to 
the upper bound computed from the n plus one. So the only little uh, subtlety in working out these proofs is that um, we need to use the this same index, even though we only have n points here, which means that if uh, if um, delta is tiny enough, uh, it fails. It, it, delta has to be at least one over n plus one, um, at, at least that large. Okay, so so that's the idea of conformalization, and so we can do the same thing with our trajectories. Um, what we do is um, uh, with these trajectories, we calculate how uh, how far the true trajectory exceeds the lower bound. So this is a different one of my tests. And, uh, and, and we go below the lower bound in this particular behavior vector. And so um, we're gonna get a bunch of, of, of values down here. And so we take the, so this, the black points of course are the delta over two quantile and or the one minus delta over two quantile. And so we take the max of that departure here, which is the, or, or how much we're above the upper curve and zero. And so we only take the positive uh, or non-negative departure. So if the true curve was inside here, um, then we'll get all zeros for these so-called exceedances, xit. So this is trajectory i times step t, how far was the true behavior uh, outside of the bounds. And then uh, what we do is um, uh, uh, we need to somehow um, uh, convert the problem. Uh, see, the, one of the challenges here is that we have 50 exceedances now, one for each time step. Uh, and we're trying to come up with a 50-dimensional confidence interval. Um, and sort of the standard way that, uh, that I, at least, would think about this problem is, oh, I need to output 50 different confidence intervals, one for each time step. But I need them to all hold simultaneously. And some of you may know about um, the Bonferroni correction, which is if you, uh, if you want 50 confidence intervals to obtain simultaneously, you have to divide delta by 50 um, in order to achieve that. And this is also known as the union bound in, in uh, computer science, because uh, we're taking the union of a set of, of things. Um, but that's a very uh, worst case. It assumes that our errors at each time step in terms of uh, probability that the bound will fail, that they're independent. But obviously, in a trajectory, they're highly dependent. Um, and so, uh, so the trick is, can we somehow reduce the problem to, to estimating a single parameter, which we'll call beta here? If we could somehow reduce the problem to just estimating one parameter, we can use this uh, uh, sort it uh, and use the, the conformalization trick. So the idea is that we're going to um, calculate the standard deviation of these exceedances uh, as a function of the time step. So sigma sub t hat is going to be the exceedances for x uh, dot comma t at time t. And for this, we need a small additional data set, maybe you know, 50 to 100 points. And then we'll rescale all of our exceedances so that they are standardized by dividing them by the, uh, the uh, standard deviation. And then finally, our, our bound is going to be uh, uh, at the bound at time t is going to be the quantile function minus beta times sigma hat. So we're going to basically uh, use beta as our scale factor and scale uh, the everything by the the how variable it is at each time step t. So now our c values are going to be the largest exceedance along each trajectory. C i is the is the worst exceedance because that's the one that we want we need to contain inside the box inside the confidence interval uh, to cover the trajectory. So we can compute the order statistics of those, those worst exceedances and then do follow the same recipe. And so this will give us a confidence interval and we can prove then a theorem that, the, that a new behavior vector B star from some trajectory tau star will fall within the prediction interval low and high. And these are functions of course of the starting state of tau star with probability one minus delta, where the probability is over the choice of the random starting states and any randomness in the policy and in the dynamics of the world. Um, so uh, I, we've applied it to two um, uh, problems. The first is uh, you know in 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 uh, collaboration with uh, 
uh, Kim Hall and Joe Albers and, and my former student, uh, Majid, we were, had worked for several years on tamarisk invasions. So the tamarisk is a tree uh, that's native to the Middle East, um, but uh, was introduced to the United States at some point, and it has been um, uh, invading the river networks of the Western US, particularly the Rio Grande River and the Colorado River have been very hard hit. Um, and so um, uh, uh, Hall and Albers are applied economists and they uh, are happy to think a bit like mathematicians in the sense that we designed a, 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 a stylized version of the problem in which a river network is just a binary tree. Um, each edge is a segment of a river or a stream. Uh, and then, so here are two streams coming together at this node and then two more streams come together here and then, and then this goes out to, uh, I don't know, um, the ocean or something. Um, and uh, the stylized part of it is that each uh, section of this river uh, is either, can, can only, only has room for one tree. Um, uh, you could go with a hundred trees or something, but, uh, but, but one tree is enough for, for the illustration. And, and uh, the, so the, everything is labeled here. The I stands for invader. Uh, and this means that there's a tamarisk tree living on this uh, edge. N is for native. So here's a native tree and E is for empty. There's no tree here. And the idea at each time step is that, uh, oh, the time steps are years. So in each year, there's some probability a tree will just die of old age or maybe a disease. And then the, the surviving trees all make seeds and those seeds drop into the rivers and then uh, propagate probabilistically uh, downstream. Um, so if this tamarisk makes some seeds, uh, they will travel downstream. Some of them will stay here. Some of them will travel downstream to here. Some of them will make it all the way down to here. Um, and, uh, and if they reach this empty uh, edge, uh, there will be native seeds probably also coming down to this. They're going to compete with each other and probabilistically one of them will get established and, and uh, grow this, either a native or a tamarisk. Uh, uh, and in the model, we can adjust how fecund the trees are, how many seeds they make, and who wins that competition and things like this. But as a, as a resource manager trying to prevent the invasion or, or, or eliminate the invasion, uh, the actions we have available are we could go to an, one of these empty slots and just plant a native tree there. Because if the slot is occupied by a tree, then these seeds cannot get established. Not enough sunlight, not enough water, or something like this. Another thing we can do is uh, go kill the tamarisk tree or try to, and that will succeed with some probability. And then uh, if we want to spend a bit more money, we can uh, do both. We can try to kill this tamarisk tree here and, uh, and plant a native in its place. Um, and of course we can just do nothing. So if we have a, an edge that already has a native tree in it, there's no reason to do anything there. Now, if we had uh, an infinite budget, we could do all that in one time step and uh, in very short order, we'd be, the problem would be solved. But the reality is in a real river network, we, we would never have enough money to afford to say process the entire you know, Mississippi River or Colorado River in one go. Um, and so uh, here we are, we have a budget that restricts us basically to only being able to act in one edge in any time step. And uh, I mean, it's, it's more sophisticated than that, but to a first approximation, that's what you should think about. Okay, and you can read more in this paper, which uh, is in the references here. So here's some example of these perspective confidence intervals and the actual trajectories for this problem. Um, so here's a starting state in which we have a lot. This is, this is our notation for the starting states. T's are tamarisks here. Um, so here we have four empty slots, two native slots and one tamarisk. And uh, we're able to go in and kill that tamarisk in the very first time step. And the uh, problem is solved basically. Um, Cause no new tamarisks can arrive from outside in this particular scenario. And so we see that the confidence interval is pretty tight. And, uh, and the true thing, we only had to pay a uh, price in the very first step and then never had to spend any more money. In this one, um, we had uh, three tamarisks and only one native and three empty slots. So obviously a tougher problem um, and the confidence interval is much wider as a consequence. But it turns out we got pretty lucky here 
we were able to kill one of the trees ourselves and the other two died natural deaths before we needed to deal with them. And what you see here are just these, uh, the, the curve does continue to go down, um, but that's because uh, native trees are dying and we are uh, replacing them. Uh, so that was a, uh, we got lucky there. And then on, test, on, on trajectory 27, it was sort of a really bad, we have five tamarisks in the starting state and just two uh, empty slots, no natives at all. So no native seeds to help us. Um, and so uh, it, the, the predicted confidence interval was already very, um, uh, uh, looking very bad, but, uh, but, but in fact, we got even unlucky several times. Um, uh, we would kill a tamarisk tree, it would get reestablished by another seed, we'd have to kill it again, it'd get reestablished again, we'd have to kill it a third time. Uh, so um, we, we, we uh, ha had a downside, um, very bad uh, exceedance. And, but remember, the guarantee is only, in this case, that 80% of the trajectories would be inside the confidence bounds. So we would expect 20% of them to fall outside. The goal is, is that these confidence bounds should at least give the, the human a kind of realistic forecast of how tough the problem is and, uh, and what's likely to happen. Okay, so of course, the way you evaluate uh, confidence intervals is to um, ask whether they achieve their so-called nominal coverage. So if delta is 0.2 here, then we, would, we wanna know whether these confidence intervals achieve 80% coverage. And so this is over 5,000 trajectories. We calculate the, um, the fraction of them for which the, the, the interval covered the, the true behavior of the system. And um, uh, so this is the uh, fraction of those 5,000 trajectories that, that, uh, that for which the interval covered truth. There are three vertical bars, but you should probably ignore the green ones. Um, the gray bars here are if we had just used the quantile regression itself. And, and, uh, and in none of these 16 configurations uh, would that have achieved the coverage. So the, the uh, bounds we're getting from quantile regression are too narrow. Um, the, uh, and then the blue bars are the method that I described uh, here, which I call the strict method. And in this problem, it achieves uh, coverage 16 out of 16. So, so it, it hits its numbers. Um, but we'll see that sometimes that's not sufficient. And I have a, an extension of it that's uh, that, that, um, called the CI method that, that in this case also hits its, its bounds. The second domain we've been looking at is uh, StarCraft battles between two sides, a, a, a blue team and a red team. Um, and it's a fairly simple battle, right? The, 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 the red team starts out with, uh, with, a, with a, on average, it's a random, the starting states are stochastic, but the, uh, the blue and red teams have some number of units each, and they're roughly of equal capabilities, these units. And then they just march toward each other and engage in a battle. Um, and uh, the, uh, we're the blue forces, um, and the red forces um, start out uh, with a peace, dis a peace disadvantage, but they're going to receive reinforcements at time 14 uh, that, they could, that, that, are, that are themselves stochastic, um, that could allow them to win. Um, and so um, the goal is to provide a probabilistic guarantee on the total blue team reward. And so um, I, I guess I don't have any example trajectories, but in this case, the uh, raw um, uh, quantile regression methods do uh, succeed in, in hitting the targets two out of 16 times. The strict method that I described earlier only succeeds five out of 16 times and the, uh, my extension, 14 out of 16 times. And you can see that uh, the, the shortcomings seem to happen up here um, primarily uh, uh, and here when we have, this is the amount of training data that's available. So yeah, I forgot to explain this. So we have uh, uh, four different groups uh, depending on Delta and within each group, we have four different uh, sample sizes for the size of our calibration data set. So um, if we have 2,000 points in our calibration data set, then, um, then the methods do quite well. Even the raw quantile regression is doing well in some of those. But when we have less data um, that, that we're not able to do as well. Uh, this is particularly true when we're trying to get the 99th quantile here, right? Or this would be the 99.5 uh, quantile. Um, it's, uh, it, we need a lot of data.
Okay, so I just want to say there is one, one important subtlety here about interpreting these prediction intervals. The 80% guarantee, if, if delta was 0.2, that we would be providing an 80% guarantee, which says that over all queries for new starting states that are drawn from the same distribution as the training trajectories, 80% of the time, the true reward uh, curve would lie inside the confidence interval. But it is not a pointwise guarantee. That is to say, if you choose a particular starting state and executed the policy a thousand times, it would not necessarily be true that 80% of the time it would be inside the interval. Um, because the, the guarantee is actually over all draws of starting states. And it's the exchangeability of the starting states that, uh, that we're protecting ourselves against. So it could be that there's some part of the state space where the confidence interval always fails and other parts of the state space where it always succeeds. And um, so it is not a pointwise guarantee. In fact, uh, it's easy to show that, you that it's impossible to get a pointwise statistical guarantee uh, in, uh, in, the, in the usual sense. Um, so, uh, so I think that th this, this is a, a shortcoming, uh, I would say of this method is that um, it doesn't really give us what I want, what we want. Of course, we can't really get what we want. Um, uh, but there's, I think there's room to improve on this. Um, so actually, um, I wonder, uh, I guess I should press on and then we can talk about questions later. Um, <clears throat> so the second part of the talk is, uh, is about anomaly detection. Um, and, uh, and, and I just will say that we define an anomaly. Well, the, the question is always, well, so uh, again, the reason we want to do anomaly detection is because in a high reliability situation, we want to be able to know whether we're seeing an unusual situation that's maybe outside of our training data. Um, uh, and uh, so in particular for um, uh, a, sta a very common application of anomaly detection is for detecting sensor failures or fraud detection or detection of cyber attacks, things like this. And um, there are many challenges. Basically, you have little or no labeled data. And even if you have labeled data, um, future anomalies are not guaranteed to come from the same distribution as past anomalies. So it's very risky to, to try to model their distribution from, from labels. Um, uh, and so the main strategy that uh, we follow is um, uh, to hope that the anomalies are going to be data points that are outliers. But, but again, our definition of anomaly is it's a data point generated by a different process than the process that's generating the so-called nominal points. So um, there is a variety of anomaly detection algorithms that have been uh, developed over the years. And uh, we did a big benchmarking study of them. Um, we've been repeating it actually every couple of years. Um, and the overall best algorithm that we have found in a sort of off the shelf, if you were, I mean, if you have a new problem, the first thing I would try for uh, data that's described using feature vectors is something called the isolation forest by Leo Ting and Joe. Um, uh, and now almost uh, nine years old or 10 years old. Um, the idea is to construct, construct a fully binary, uh, random, fully random binary tree. So we choose one of the attributes of the data where you're gonna index the attributes by J. Um, and then we look at the range of values of the response of, the, of that feature and, uh, and choose a splitting threshold uniformly at random inside that range. And then we do that recursively splitting the data the same way as if you were growing a decision tree, except we don't have any um, response variable or class label or anything. We're just splitting based on the, the input features. And the, the quantity we're interested in measuring is how many random splits does it take to isolate a data point, Xi, from all the other points. So we grow this tree until every data point is in its own leaf. You know, as a, as a, a machine learning person, you should immediately say, oh, we're overfitting terribly. But, the, but we're, not, we're not planning for this tree to generalize. We're just planning for it to um, measure the isolation depths of the data points. So we'll let D of Xi be the depth, in this case, three of this point, because we've gone through three tests. And, um, and the intuition is that if a data point is an outlier, then if we sort of are tossing, I think of this as like throwing darts at a dartboard, except the darts are actually splits 
along the axes. Um, if we're throwing random splits at the data, then how many random splits does it take? If a, if a data point is very, very far away from the rest of the data, it should take very few random uh, splits to, to separate it. Whereas if a data point is deeply, deeply embedded inside thousands of other data points, it's going to take many, many, many random splits until that data point is in its own leaf. And so uh, any one isolation tree is a very noisy thing, but if we build an ensemble of 100 of them or 1,000 of them and calculate the average depth of Xi, then we can get a nice anomaly score and they have a way of normalizing it onto a nice scale. So um, we've been applying this to some problems in cybersecurity. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the exciting discoveries we found is that uh, you can incorporate analyst feedback and greatly improve your uh, anomaly detection performance. Um, and so uh, what we do is imagine you get a batch of data every day, um, you run it all through your anomaly detector, and then you select the most anomalous uh, data point and show that to your analyst. And they say, yes, that is a, a true alarm or no, it's a false alarm. Because the, the, the facts of life with anomaly detection is you will have a significant false alarm rate. Um, and so the question was, could we incorporate that feedback from an analyst? Because the analyst has to decide this and then decide whether, oh, yes, that looks like a, an attack. I need to put someone on studying that. Um, could we incorporate that analyst feedback and improve the anomaly detection process? And so we had two students, Shubha Moidas and Amran Siddiqui, who published papers in the last few years. Um, and what we find is, yes, we can get huge improvements in anomaly discovery by incorporating analyst feedback. So the plot on the left is plotting the number of, of points that we've shown to the analyst and therefore the number of, of, of feedbacks we've gotten. And the vertical axis is how many true alarms did we find? And the black dotted line is if we only uh, just presented the, the uh, cases in the, in, in, based on our initial anomaly scores, um, we would find that after 100, uh, we, we had only found about 22 true alarms. Uh, and with uh, Shubhamoy's method, we can get about 50 true alarms. And with our, our best method, this uh, generalized linear anomaly detector uh, from Amran Siddiqui, 70. Uh, uh, so, so we can see that we go from having 80% false alarms down to 30% false alarms by incorporating analyst feedback, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and in fact, uh, we, this is being deployed at a, at a manufacturing company. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but I was skeptical of it because, of course, that was based on a benchmark data set from the UC Irvine repository that wasn't really about anomalies at all. It was about thyroid disease. So um, uh, what about actual um, uh, uh, feedback from or um, uh, cyber attacks? Um, we were part of a DARPA program on advanced persistent threats. And here we're, uh, and, and there was, so there was a red team that was inserting cyber attacks into a network and we had to detect them. And in this case, the vertical axis is the number of alarms processed by the analyst uh, until we have our first true hit, where our true positive. And the orange bars are if there's no feedback into our anomaly detection, and the blue bars is if there is feedback. And so we can see on host number one, without feedback, it takes 42 false alarms before we get a true hit versus three. Here it's 65 versus 10. Here it's 42 versus 21 or something. So in all cases, we had a huge improvement in our ability to rapidly find these attacks. So it really works. <laughs> uh, and we were just delighted to see this. Um, and the method is basically you can take your isolation forest and you can convert it into a gigantic linear model. Each node in each tree becomes a Boolean feature and we put an initial weight on each feature of 1.0. So if we have a data point that goes through this tree and down this branch, these two Boolean features are turned on. In this one, these two Boolean features, uh, or these four Boolean features, I guess, I'm misreading this. These three, these four. Um, and, uh, and so you get a vector U of these Boolean features and then you have a, a, a vector of weights. And if we assign a weight of one to each one, then, uh, the, what, and then we take the dot product u dot w, that is giving us the total isolation depth uh, in the entire isolation forest. 
And so we can use that. And then what we do is we apply these wonderful online convex optimization algorithms like online mirror descent to do the weight adjustments. Um, and uh, what they do effectively is if a data point was, uh, was a true anomaly, then we want to shrink the weights on this path to sort of make it more shallow, right? More anomalous. Whereas if it was a, uh, a false alarm, we want to lengthen the paths uh, so the weights are increased to, so that uh, so the isolation depth is, is bigger. Okay, well, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to have to skip rare category uh, or open category detection, um, but we have some techniques for uh, dealing with that problem too. And yeah, it took me a lot longer than it should have. Um, let me just conclude then. So I started by talking about robust artificial intelligence and high reliability organizations and, uh, and the importance of of doing competence modeling uh, so that the system can describe to its teammates how uh, competent it is in a given situation and the importance of anomaly detection for achieving high reliability. Then we talked about competence modeling and pr producing calibrated prediction intervals for reinforcement learning. Uh, and then we talked about anomaly detection, but I only got to half of my anomaly detection uh, bit. Um, so uh, I have, uh, I uh, want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation, DARPA, and the gift from Huawei, and also Kiri Wagstaff, who's working with me these days um, for, for help with the feedback on the paper. And uh, I'll, I'll send a copy of the slides uh, to you all um, that has all of the uh, citations here. So I'll wind back here and answer questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Hi, Tom. This is Lee Giles. How are you? I'm fine. Nice to see you. So it was a great talk. Um, it seems that, that an important part of what this problem, of, of what you're trying to do and what we would like to do is getting good data from representative problem domains that have these kind of issues. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how how do we get that? I mean, where, where do we start? I mean, it's, is this, is there a data source for these kind of problems? Um, there, there is nothing, uh, I guess, I, I mean, one of the reasons we undertook our, uh, for the anomaly detection work, uh, we built a big benchmark collection of about 20,000, or maybe it's only 12,000 um, uh, data sets uh, for benchmarking anomaly detection algorithms. That was based on repurposing data from the Irvine, UC Irvine collection. So it's not real anomaly data. Um, and, and as you may know, you know, when you look at a lot of the anomaly detection papers that, that come out of KDD, uh, you know, a lot of the time they're from companies, but unfortunately their data is, is confidential. They can't like put customer transaction data uh, 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 openly. So it is a big challenge. Um, I think one possibility is uh, scientific data, right? From scientific experiments because they, uh, confront these things all the time. I'm involved in a, in a project on trying to, to uh, deploy and operate a large network of automated weather stations in Africa. And so we're getting a lot of experience with broken sensors there. Um, and uh, so that, that might be one source. But, uh, and I think uh, cyber attack data, we should, probably should also be able to get uh, more open source data there. Thank you. Uh, John, hey, I think you have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Uh, so uh, in our one-on-one -on -one meeting, I mentioned to you some of our work on the modeling human, uh, human agent team using shared mental model. Uh, Great. Um, uh, and also uh, related to your uh, competence modeling work, it also uh, make me think about a related topic, which is uh, human agent or human uh, AI trust issue. Yes. And so in one of our uh, study, uh, the size of study wasn't very big, but uh, the goal was to try to understand factors that can affect human calibration to AI decision-making recommendation. Uh, the, the, the problem domain is discrete recommendation, not continuous. Right. Uh, and in that study, what we found was uh, the capability to explain 
the reason of uh, let's say weakness of a performance in certain uh, right. in certain area enhance human capability to calibrate so that they are more capable to accept the recommendation when they should and more capable to reject when they shouldn't. Right. We and we uh, obviously in my analyst in the loop uh, picture, we need to show that analyst an explanation about why we thought it was an anomaly. It's not good enough to dump a 60 dimensional feature vector on them and say, we think this is bad. Um, so you have to have some kind of um, explanation. And we worked on a simple explanation based on the importance of each of the features for the, you know, for the anomaly declaration, sort of, uh, you know, similar to the kinds of explanations people get out of Lyme and stuff like that. Um, uh, if we were doing it now, I think we would try to use these integrated gradient techniques. Um, there was a lovely paper at ICML this year from, from uh, Google on uh, uh, real-time management of buildings. So they, you know, Google has all these buildings and they get the sensor readings from the, the, the temperature and airflow and so on. And uh, they built an anomaly detection system uh, that, that in real time gives them anomaly scores for each building, but also gives, uh, uses the integrated gradient technique to, to present explanations. And, uh, and that's a deployed system. It's just uh, really beautiful, I think, uh, as an example of a really good user interface you can design to, to give, give insights. Great, thank you. Uh, Justin, I think you have a question. Yeah, some, so first off, great talk. This is super interesting. Um, one of the things that got me thinking was the approach to confidence intervals here. I may be thinking about it wrong, but the way I've interpreted this is somewhat of a kind of out of sample prediction or like cross validation based approach to correcting confidence intervals for generalization error. Um, if that's the case, I mean, do you think that First off, is that, am I even thinking of this? Right, yeah, pressure? I mean, but it's, yeah, if, if you're familiar with the work people have been doing on, on calibrating probabilities for classifiers, it's very similar in that you, um, yeah, you, somebody gives you a classifier, or in my case, gives you a quantile regression model, and then you want to, and now you have another data set, and you want to adjust that to match your data set. It doesn't even need to be the same data source as the original uh, model was trained on. But it needs to be uh, IID representative of your future data, yeah. And so then we're doing a sort of post post learning uh, correction to to get calibrated, uh, uh, yeah, intervals. Well, I guess part of my question is so if that's the case, you know, there's all this um, interest in, for example, model selection with an M open versus M closed system, and you know, so beyond decision making, reinforcement learning, or prediction. You know, um, the question of, of an inference, whether or not you could um, achieve better confidence intervals that are a little bit more robust to model misspecification using a, an approach like this. Yeah, uh, I don't know the answer, but, um, but, but that's such a super important question. <laughs> I agree, yeah. I mean, this still seems very dependent on, on the, the exchangeability assumption. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, but 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 it probably is less vulnerable to a, yeah a model misspecification. But that's uh, also um, that's an exchangeability of the underlying data generating process, right? Not it, right. as far not as I know, it's not exchangeability conditional on your model. Or right, but I but I think it's uh, um, yeah. Well, yeah, we should think about this more. But my but my yeah my initial reaction is that that uh, that probably this does uh, that this this would help. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vasant has asked a question, uh, the problem of developing, Vasant, do you wanna ask, ask, ask yourself? You're muted out. Hi. Uh, yeah. Hi, Tom. This Hello. Is, uh, how are you doing? So, uh, great talk. Uh, the, so, you know, I was really, I mean, uh, everything that you said was interesting, but I was sort of really intrigued by the, the first, uh, the beginning of the talk where you talked about the human AI collaboration and the need for shared uh, mental models. And uh, it, to me, that suggests uh, kind of a whole variety of problems in knowledge representation, right? So we've been working on knowledge representation for a variety of purposes, primarily for getting machines to do things for us. But if the goal is really uh, building a shared mental model between uh, 
AI system and a human, then we need to be thinking about representations that are kind of, uh, you know- They're compatible. Yeah. Uh, compatible in some right. sense, right? Uh, and uh, so communicable to humans, communicable to machines. So that at least uh, in my looking around, I haven't found a whole lot of work on that. Uh, do you know of anything that, uh, uh, that you have come across? Uh, well, um, I guess the, the first thing that occurs to me is, you know, Rao Kampampati at, at Arizona State has been looking at um, what he calls explicable planning, right? So, so he's thinking of planning problems, but the planner needs to, uh, the, the resulting agent needs to behave in a way that it's easy for the human to explain why it's doing what it's doing. Um, uh, and so he does constrain the plan to, to obey certain uh, uh, explainability or sort of explicability, he calls it explicability, because it's not, it's not that I, my, it, it means that the, you know, when you have a choice of a, maybe a plan that's optimal, but hard to explain why it's optimal, you don't use that. Instead you use a plan that's pretty good, but easier to explain why it's desirable. Um, so making that trade off, but, um, but I, but I think he's still assuming that the, the action space and the states are, are already satisfy the knowledge representation uh, uh, constraints that you're talking about. Yeah, and, and of course, we in, I, we're currently working on anomaly detection for images in computer vision. And there we have a huge mismatch between the learned representations of deep networks and the kinds of descriptions people would like to have. It, it's just... Uh, uh, very, very difficult. And I think um, uh, that, that we uh, also that, that mismatch is leading to poor performance by anomaly detection too, because we're trying to detect our sort of statistical anomalies at a very low level of representation. And, uh, and we need to be operating at many, many different representational levels. Uh, so, uh, so I think knowledge representation, uh, I agree, is, is the big challenge. Uh, for machine learning and, and AI, it always has been, uh, and it continues to be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think in this context, you know, it's sort of like uh, you almost need uh, mental. I mean, machine has to have a model of what the human. That too, uh, absolutely. Yes. Humans know, right, and and yes. what might be useful in a particular context because you cannot provide everything. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so yes, absolutely, and and of course, people that look at human-robot interaction uh, ha have been uh, maybe the folks that have thought about this the most because um, the robot has to reason about what the human thinks the robot is doing, and then act in a way that is easy to read for the human, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and uh, and that's very context dependent. Uh, so we have quite a lot of HRI work here at Oregon State these days. So. Thanks. I, I look forward to talking to you about that later. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Once again, you know, please, please join me in thanking Dr. Dietrich for the wonderful seminar. Thank you so much.